In 1972, when I was a six-year-old boy, my family moved from Minneapolis to Canada. And that move might as well have been to the moon. It was a new place and a new school where everyone spoke a different language. Except for my group of friends who lived on Sesame Street. Each afternoon, I would meet my friends and wait for my favorite, it's true, Maria. My first crush was inevitable given our shared interest in fix-it shops, books, making friends, counting, and construction. Although, truth be told, Maria's lessons and hammers, my first, didn't turn out very well for either of us. So here we are in 2016, and that not-so-little boy can hardly contain his joy introducing the award-winning actress and writer who has been and is Maria to so many of us, Sonia Manzano. <laughs> Raised in the South Bronx, Sonia grew up amid the chaos of a boisterous home filled with noisy relatives and nosy neighbors, right? And like so many of you, Sonia was inspired and encouraged by her teachers. And in her case, it was to audition for the High School of the Performing Arts. And what a journey it has been since. A scholarship took Sonia to Carnegie Mellon University, and in 1970, she starred in the original cast of Godspell. Shortly thereafter, she joined the cast of Sesame Street, where she enchanted and taught two generations of young people. Sonia has won 15 Emmy Awards, including a Lifetime Achievement Emmy for her television writing. She has performed on Broadway, has authored critically acclaimed books. She has received the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Award and the Hispanic Heritage Award for Education. Later this month, she will receive the Raul Julia Award, which recognizes the extraordinary artistic achievement of Latin American individuals from the Hope for Families and Children Foundation. So let's give a warm CUNY SPS welcome to Sonia Manzano. Thank you so much. Felicidades. Congratulations to all of you. And certainly thank you for including me in your celebratory evening. When your dean told me that you were between the ages of 26 and 60, I knew I was the perfect person to speak to you because I too am between the ages of 26 and 60. As you know, I spent 44 years on Sesame Street and I recently left the show. I mentioned my retirement at an American Librarians Association conference in San Francisco last July because I thought it would be a good way to segue into talking about my memoir, Becoming Maria, Love and Chaos in the South Bronx. The teachers and librarians tweeted about my retirement, and by the time I got back to the East Coast, it had become national news. Lesson learned, do not underestimate the power of teachers and librarians. When asked why I left Sesame Street, I say it was because 44 years was a long enough time for me to wait for Oscar the Grouch to propose. <laughs> I'll never forget the first time I saw Sesame Street. I walked into the student union of Carnegie Mellon University where I was attending and there on the screen was a very young, very bald, James Earl Jones reciting the alphabet in a very deliberate manner, A, B, C, as the letters flashed over his head. I thought I was watching a show that taught lip reading. 
But what really struck me was when they cut away and I saw Susan and Gordon, a warm, friendly African-American couple, talking to me from an inner city street. This was a shocking image in 1969, and it had special meaning for me. I'm Puerto Rican, born in Manhattan, and raised in the Bronx. And I watched, I watched a lot of television growing up, and I loved shows like Father Knows Best and Leave It to Beaver, all the shows you can see on cable network TV land now. I loved all those shows, even though I never saw anybody who looked like me, talked like me, or lived in the same kind of neighborhoods that I lived in. And it took a subconscious toll on me. I felt invisible. And I wondered how I was going to contribute to a society that didn't see me. How wonderful that after my TV marriage to Luis, we became to the Latino audience what Susan and Gordon were to the African American audience, a nice married couple that had the same hopes and dreams as any other Americans. We did it so well that many people think that Emilio Delgado, who plays Luis and I, are really married. <laughs> I was approached by a fan now, we were approached by a fan who gushed and said how wonderful it was that her children should see real love on television. <laughs> we told her we were not actually married. She paused a moment, sucked in her breath and said, well, as long as you really love each other. People believe in the Muppets as much as they believe in my marriage to Luis. An elderly man with white hair, Carol Spinney, plays Big Bird. Once Carol, unaware that there was a child in the studio, took the top half of his suit off. At which time the child said to me, Maria, does Big Bird know there's a man in him? But my work on Sesame Street isn't the real reason I am the perfect person to speak to you. What I want to share with you is my journey getting to Sesame Street, or let me put it this way, can I tell you how I got, how I got to Sesame Street? It, it was not a straight path. I know many of you have not followed a straight path either. Some of you worked or raised families while you studied. Some of you returned to school to finish interrupted educations. Some of you even learned online. My educational career also had twists and turns. Here's some background on my journey. My parents migrated from Puerto Rico after World War II and like many others, found their way to the mainland United States to escape grinding poverty and find a decent way to live. My father worked as a roofer and my mother was a seamstress in a factory. They struggled with the system. They struggled with speaking English. They struggled so much that the term for the struggle, la lucha, peppered their everyday conversation. If people came over and said, how are you? They would say, well, here we are in the struggle. If they answered the phone, they'd say, hello, here we are in la lucha. But mostly they struggled with each other. Theirs was a cyclical story of domestic violence. When I wasn't looking, when I wasn't looking to escape their lifestyle by watching television as I said that I loved, I sought the comfort of school. And school was very easy for me in the South Bronx because very little was expected of me. All I had to do was show up. The Board of Education had a tracking system in place. If you were smart, you were put in the smartest, most challenging class. If you didn't speak English, had asthma, or were emotionally disturbed, you were put in the slow learners class and you never change track. I was smart, so I was put in the accelerated classes, which I excelled in even while giving myself manicures at my desk and drying my nails by raising my hand to answer questions. 
I had good teachers and bad teachers. During Brotherhood Week, a 1950s initiative, a teacher told our class of all Puerto Rican students that there were three kinds of people in the world, black ones, white ones, and yellow ones. When a kid named Juan Martinez raised his hand and asked about brown people, she said there were no such things as brown people. But that teacher was offset by the many good teachers I had, and a good one took me to see West Side Story in 1957. And I had an epiphany. Yes, because of the Hispanic sensibility in that movie, but also because of the way the movie presented things I saw every day. Suddenly a fire escape wasn't a place you threw water balloons off of, it was a place where momentous decisions were made. In that movie, a schoolyard fence became a glorious pattern of beauty. It did for fire hydrants what the impressionist painter Claude Monet did for water lilies. Seeing West Side Story gave me an inkling about what art could be, and that moment of realization put me on higher ground. I couldn't control what was going on around me, but I could certainly separate myself from it. It made me see that there was something more to life than la lucha. But it didn't make me want to be an actress. I still had to get through elementary school. Finally, another teacher suggested I had talent and I should audition for the High School of Performing Arts on 46th Street in Manhattan. I had never heard of it. My dreams of that, at that time were to become a secretary or a bookkeeper and get my own apartment. <laughs> you might know the High School of Performing Arts as the fame school. They made a movie about it and they made a television series of the, of, uh, of, of it inspired by the school. Performing arts accepted kids from all, all over the city in the disciplines of dance, music, and drama. And I got in for drama, but I was in for the biggest shock of my life. I found I could not compete with middle class kids who had good elementary school educations. I didn't know how to write. I didn't know the difference between a debate and a fight. I didn't know how to think critically. I had been taught to memorize. My grades plummeted, and I wondered how I could have been so smart in the Bronx and so stupid in Manhattan. <laughs> but I struggled barely maintaining a C average, and I was determined to attend college. Because of bad grades, the only way I was going to go to college was if I tried out for schools that accepted you on talent and not grades. I thought I'd follow the current day model of African American boys getting into school on athletic scholarships and not their grades. But there was another hurdle to overcome. Teachers had to recommend you to those schools that had those specialized acting programs and the teachers at the High School of Performing Arts were not going to recommend me. So I got applications on my own, asked my after-school boss to write me a recommendation, and somehow got accepted to Carnegie Mellon University. But once again, I'm weighing over my head. I remember I wrote an essay that I thought was brilliant because it told of my life living in a house ruled by domestic violence, but the girl who wrote about the prom got all the accolades. I complained to the professor, who agreed I probably had the more profound essay, but she could barely read it because I could not organize, identify a paragraph or spell. It happens to a lot of us, Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor, the other Sonia from the Bronx, She was a top student at a very rigorous Catholic high school in the Bronx, but even she had to hone up on her writing skills when she got accepted to Princeton University. So I took every remedial course offered me, and there were many, because the United States was an idealistic country then. The Civil Rights Movement was in full swing. The Peace Corps was up and running. President Johnson wanted to create the great society. Women wanted to join the workforce for the first time and would burn their bras in protest. I guess now we'd have to burn our spanxes. 
except they do not burn. I know this because I tried to dry a pair in a hotel room with a hair dryer. Ladies, don't try it. So I continued to get help in courses I needed, and then I was lucky enough to get in a school production of a show called Godspell. The show came to New York, me with it, it was a big hit. And then I got the call to audition for Sesame Street. It certainly wasn't what I started out to do. I got hooked when I realized Sesame Street was more than about teaching the alphabet and counting. It was attempting to change society on a preschool level. I got caught up in the mission of closing the education gap and eliminating racism. And before I knew it, 44 years had gone by. It was wonderful, but entertaining and educating children had not been on my agenda. And that is the crux of it and the theme of these remarks. Stay flexible enough to maneuver when things don't go the way you expect them to. The fact that we live in a diverse society makes the ability to maneuver all the more important. We live in the midst of cultures that might clash. The complexity of the issue was made clear to me when I saw the movie Real Women Have Curves. In it, a Mexican-American girl on the West Coast struggles because she has received a full scholarship to Columbia University in New York City, and her family's dilemma was that they were such a close-knit family, they couldn't let her go. I left that movie thinking that it was an unrealistic premise. What parents are not going to let their kid accept the full scholarship to an Ivy League school? Only shortly thereafter, I visited a community in Brownsville, Texas, that was struggling with that same problem. These families were so closely knit, they could not let their kids leave town to accept scholarships or even lucrative internships. I've heard of other families that come from cultures where there's always an aunt or a grandmother around ready to take care of the kid to, uh, so he never has to attend preschool. Unfortunately, that kid starts school at a disadvantage because he doesn't have the social skills that all the other kids that have been to preschool might have. So you could say that some of those fine family values could stand in the way of certain children succeeding in America. I was raised in an environment where you never questioned adults. I was 10 years old before I realized it was okay to ask a question. It happened in elementary school when a poor teacher was trying to teach long division to a group of obedient, well-raised Puerto Ricans. We stared at him trying to comprehend when suddenly a question just burst out of me. He didn't yell, he didn't send me to the principal's office or put it on my permanent record. He answered my question and the world of possibilities opened up to me. Being obedient and shy might help you survive in what might have been in a, a repressive religious culture in 1950s Puerto Rico, but it doesn't help you get ahead in America. It's important to figure out how to honor our cultures, but also recognize when we have to maneuver around them. At this point, I'm compelled to comment on the political atmosphere we live in now. When I was in elementary school, I remember singing the Pledge of Allegiance and having my heart swell with patriotism. I felt this was the best country in the world with the smartest, most compassionate and caring people. I felt this even as I felt the disdain of teachers because I was brown and poor. I felt it even as I knew my parents were being taken advantage of. I felt it even as I knew I was being marginalized. I don't know where I got those feelings, but even when I was in my 20s and I saw society's faults, those patriotic feelings remained. I wonder what I'm supposed to do with those feelings when some presidential hopefuls say things that would have gotten me sent to the principal's office. My mother would have had to come in. They would have washed my mouth out with soap. I don't know the answer, but I suppose this is my long-winded way of begging you all not to sit out this presidential election cycle. Please, 
Please keep up with the news on the PBS NewsHour is what I would recommend, and by all means, vote in your best interests. Finally, I'll finish up by repeating what everybody will tell you today, follow your dreams, and I will tell you the same thing, but I will also tell you to be open to change and not be afraid to change your course. I could never have predicted the creative life I ended up having on television or as a writer of children's books and novels if I had done that. So follow your visions, but don't wear blinders. Follow your instincts, but ask questions about how to do things. Ask for advice and get the help if you need to. Use the fact that your lives haven't run in a straight line as an asset. Take the fact that you've juggled raising a family, working, picking up your education where you lift off, at, left it off as an extra special accomplishment. Use your experience to your advantage, now enhanced by the degrees you are about to receive. Don't forget that you already know things that you could not have learned in school. I was successful as Maria on Sesame Street because I never forgot my journey. I always imagine a kid like me looking for comfort on television the way I used to when I was a kid, and that strengthened my resolve to provide that comfort for children myself. Some of you will change course slightly, and some of you will change course dramatically. I am confident that you will all succeed. Just make sure that you all ride in the direction that the horse is going. Congratulations. Gracias. <laughs>